To watch a new study at the 2021 UN Climate Change Conference, that's uh, COP26, Nigeria committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2060. Now, the country will have to move from conventional fossil fuels to alternative renewable energy sources like wind and solar to reach this goal. As part of the country's uh, dedication to the COP26 agreement, Nigeria enacted the Climate Change Act in 2021 to provide a functional framework for mainstream climate change management at a national level. On August 24, 2022, the Nigerian uh, government uh, launched its uh, Energy Transition Plan, or ETP, designed to simultaneously tackle the challenges of energy poverty and the climate change crisis. To help us uh, get greater understanding of how this plan can align with global climate consensus is Damilola Hamid Balogun, a lawyer, CEO and co-founder of uh, Youth Sustainable Development Network. Many thanks for joining us. Uh, I mean, it's good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. It's so, my pleasure. Very good. Where is Nigeria currently on its energy transition plan and, of course, initiative? All right. I think that's a very fantastic question. Um, of course, we understand, as you mentioned earlier, Nigeria pledged net zero by 2060 during COP20, COP26 in Glasgow. And of course, um, to drive it round, to drive it down, before the conference itself, Nigeria passed the National Climate Change Act, right? In line with ensuring that that target is met. And in collaboration with Rockefeller Foundation, Sustainable Energy for All, and the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, Nigeria launched its energy transition plan. And what this transition plan is saying is that Look, Nigeria has a roadmap towards achieving net zero by 2060. And so with this transition, Nigeria is basically looking at five key sectors. So first is power. Of course, evidently we can see that there is a lot of uh, challenges. Power. Yes, right now as we speak in that mm. regard. So tapping into what renewable energy has to offer is definitely one of the key ways to go in line with the transition plan. Of course, also looking into the area of transport. Of course, we want to look into deploying EVs and ensuring that um, emissions are being reduced, especially that, for a fact, it's also stated that between 2000 and 2022, it is clear that 1.5% of global grants and funding with respect to energy transition only came down to sub-Saharan Africa. So we see that there are funds that are being channeled towards this particular aim, but it is also important that we are able to position properly. And that is what the energy transition plan has in mind. Mm -hmm. But of course, working with relevant stakeholders, ensuring proper regulations and policies are put in place is definitely another way to go. I can tell you there are a lot of policies when it comes to this, but I think a pressing issue is execution. Yes. All right, then, I mean, we're talking about this commitment to uh, carbon neutrality. And um, a lot of people have already even said that it's a very ambitious goal to meet by 2060, especially in the context of Nigeria's unique uh, socioeconomic and environmental challenges. Now, you talk about these policies. Now, in the light of the socioeconomic and infrastructural challenges that, we, that may impact the implementation of this energy transition plan, how can policymakers and stakeholders across a uh, board address these challenges to ensure that there's a smooth and equitable transition, of course, to renewable energy sources? Thank you very much. And I think that is one area the government has a huge role to play, to de-risk a lot of these things. So I'll give you an example. So because of the current um, currency convertibility that we are facing, and of course also with the issue of not even having the access to technology itself when it comes to renewable energy, we have the government to play an essential role. And what do I mean? What, what I'm trying to say is that investors are willing to invest, right? Because at the end of the day, we need funds and we need money to drive this energy sector forward. And then in achieving this, we have to ensure that one pressing concern for investors is the fact that there is still so much political and social instability as far as Nigeria is concerned. So as an investor, if I want to invest my money in a business or in, a, in an idea, I want to be sure that I am able to get my money back. Mm -hmm. And then in case of any breach of agreement, I'm able to get appropriate judgment in the right court of jurisdiction. Those are pressing issues, right? Yeah. And so as a result of this, we need to be able to take care of all of this part to ensure that we build confidence in the investors that are willing to come into the business. Mm -hmm. And of course, in that regard, we also need to ensure that the local financial companies are very, very 
supported. Mm -hmm. What do I mean in this case? So if I approach a bank in Nigeria today, if I say I want to invest, I need some money to invest in a renewable energy yeah. um, project, they will they, definitely not want to give me that because to them it's kind of strange. And this is where we are calling on the role of governments and even the MDBs, the DFIs, what can they do to ensure that they build a business case as far as energy sector is concerned in ensuring that people have not only access to energy, but clean and affordable source of energy? Very good, Amit. And, uh, you know, we're still talking about uh, Nigeria and the rest of the world, Nigeria not being in isolation. Now, when it comes to global climate consensus, you can't help but notice uh, hesitance and reluctance by the world's highest emitters of CO2 emissions, as it were. So how can developing nations like Nigeria change the narrative here when they're seeing those ordinarily should show example in terms of their commitment to uh, you know, net zero emissions, as it were? That's a great question. And I think we need to speak in one accord. Essentially, we need to speak in one accord. So for example, we also need to be able to decide what the energy transition future looks like for us in accordance with our own reality. Mm. And the reason why I'm saying this is there's been debate over it now that should gas be used as a transition fuel or not. And then you, you, you also see the division between African countries saying that, okay, gas should not be used, gas should be used. A clear example is one of the key points for the energy transition plan itself of Nigeria, indicating that gas is to be used as a transition fuel. At least we, have, we want to achieve clean energy and affordable energy by 2030 in line with the sustainable development goals. But of course, to ensure that that future is met, we need to work with something right now. But we also have the major emitters telling us that no, gas cannot be used as an agent. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, it's, it is important that when we then go to high level conferences such as COP, Conference of Parties, it is important that we have the credentials, we have the ideas, we have the narrative to tell what the reality of what we want looks like. Mm -hmm. So this is not just going to be an agenda of just a group of countries directing the affairs of what every other part of the world should adopt. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think it is important that African countries, especially countries in sub-Saharan Africa, for a fact that we emit very less, yeah. it is important that we speak in one accord and we are able to project our reality to ensure that we are actually pushing towards what we want and not being directed. Mm. Oh, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I really wanted to talk to you about you know, job creation uh, being a key component yeah. of the energy transition, especially when we're seeing the potential of offset job losses in the fossil fuel uh, sector. But we've run out of time. I really appreciate your uh, time and analysis today. Damilola Hamid Balogun, lawyer and dedicated leader in the youth uh, development and sustainability.